What's ahead in the new year at the Pulitzer? That's next on City Corner. I'm Steve Potter and welcome to City Corner. Well, there's always a lot going on at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation. Its uh, campus and galleries are located in the Grand Center Arts District. And we're gonna take a look back and a look ahead today on the show. Please welcome two curators uh, from the Pulitzer. That's Stephanie Weisberg and Tamara Schenkenberg. Welcome to both of you. Thanks Pleasure to be here. Um, how, how's everything in the Grand Center Arts District, by the way? Always exciting, <laughs> uh, especially at the beginning of the year. You know, True. we have the Pulitzer, the Contemporary Art Museum, the Sheldon. It's become really a vibrant district. And I might mention both of you have been there a while. Yes, that's true. We've Six had a or pleasure seven years at least here. for both of you, right? Yeah. Yep. So, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you can probably comment on this. And you know, I was at St. Louis Public Radio for a long time, which is around the corner. Mm -hmm. And before that, of course, I used to go to the Fox. And there's always been the Fox and the Powell Hall. But uh, since the Pulitzer was there and the other places you mentioned, it certainly has had an incredible renaissance and the Pulitzer has played a really important part in that. Any, any thoughts about that? Well, maybe just that our founder, Emily Rao Pulitzer, you know, has been an incredible benefactor and a philanthropist and her decision to locate the Pulitzer at the Grand Center was meant to really be a part of those broader revitalization efforts mm -hmm. whose results that we can see now with all of these incredible institutions that are there now that you're mentioning. And not just institutions, there's some great restaurants. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's all very walkable. You can go see the symphony, then come to the Pulitzer. And um, Forbes actually just named the Grand Center uh, one of America's most exciting arts districts this year. So there's definitely truth to the fact that um, there's a lot of resurgence and energy in the space. Yeah, am I wrong? I always think, you know, um, how great our art scene is here. Mm -hmm. I mean, after New York and Chicago and LA, I don't know, I think we're up there. Absolutely, I think we are always so proud to be working here and to also be great colleagues with curators at the St. Louis Art Museum, at the Kemper, uh, which is a part of Washington University. We mentioned our neighbor, Contemporary Art Museum. So it's a very vibrant, exciting arts ecosystem. And that's just museums, not to mention the many galleries who are also a part of that. Right, well, we've got a lot. Yes, and they're all free. Which yes, is... <laughs> that's, a, that's the best part. Yes. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, we're gonna look at some things that are currently there, some things that are coming up. But uh, first, um, I read a newsletter, a newsletter recently from your executive director, Kara Stark. And just briefly, uh, tell me a little bit about her. Yeah, Kara um, moved here from New York in 2015. She took over as director shortly after the Pulitzer reopened its building after renovating our lower level galleries and expanding to almost double the square footage that we were before. And she's also overseen the expansion of the museum um, beyond the Tadao Ando uh, landmark building into a larger campus that includes a rain garden across the street right. that's called Park Lake and a 19th century church just down the street that has been stabilized and renovated by the Pulitzer in public space. That's an incredible space. thing, I think, that church. Mm. Um, real quickly, a couple of things in her newsletter I wanted to ask you about. She was reflecting back on 2023. Number one, she made the point that the numbers are up as far as attendance because, of course, you suffered through COVID like everybody else. Yes, yes we did. And it's been a wonderful year in that regard, just to see the resurgence, the numbers, the visitorship being back. It's been a really great year. Another so. point she makes is the people that come there. You know, they're not just from St. Louis County or adjoining counties, um, from around the nation and around the world. Yeah, we get visitors from, from all over and um, it's actually a pretty, pretty big um, percentage of our audience are people who are um, coming to St. Louis to see, as you mentioned, the wonderful art scene that exists here. Mm -hmm. And she also, one other point she made was uh, sometimes somebody sort of famous pops in. Might be a famous uh, musician or producer, an art collector, something like that. Yes, and all of the above uh, is uh, represented by Jay-Z, uh, who popped by. Um, he had, he was not only interested in the arts, um, 
in St. Louis. He himself is a collector, as you mentioned. He also um, built with his wife, Beyonce, a building um, by Tadeo Ando, an architect of our building. So it was just really a pleasure. I guess when someone, great famous, fun to have when someone famous comes by, do they let you know ahead of time? Sometimes, yeah. This was definitely pre-planned. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet sometimes they just pop in, though. Yeah. I would think. Well, let's look back at a couple of things. Um, I think it was last March, uh, the first museum solo exhibit of a First Nation artist? Mm -hmm. In St. Louis. So, yes, that was Faye Heavy Shield Confluences. Um, it was the first museum exhibit um, by an Indigenous artist in the St. Louis area. So it was a great pleasure to work with her, especially because she created new work that took inspiration from St. Louis uh, places and histories. And then in addition of that, there was another first um, with the exhibition Nature of Things, Medieval Art and Ecology. And it was the first exhibition of its kind to really think about the ecological environmental impact of art making in the Middle Ages. Hmm. There are two exhibitions uh, that opened in September. They're still up. Let's talk about those briefly. Then we're going to talk about a couple more that are, that are coming up. One, and I've, we've got some images uh, that we'll put up on the screen now, and you can just talk. It's called Around Orange. What's all that about? Around Orange is an exhibition with the New York-based artist Sarah Crowner, who um, is on the screen right now. She uh, works in painting, uh, tile, installation, and uh, collaborates with performers. And for the Pulitzer, she's created three site-specific uh, commissions that respond to the museum's building and our permanent collection. Before we get into more of that, we've got a short video that you guys had uh, put together about this very thing. Why don't we share it with our audience right now? The way your body feels really affects the way you see things. That was sort of the impetus behind this. My name is Sarah Crowner, and the exhibition is called Around Orange. The painting that I'm showing at the Pulitzer Art Foundation is a 75-foot-long frieze. The paintings are hung horizontally in response to the Ellsworth Kelly, which is hanging in an adjacent space. Because it's so large, one's body needs to be active in the reading of this artwork. I liked the idea that this frieze kind of moves from the indoors and then pierces through to the outside and becomes an outdoor painting. The mosaic outside, that is about the relationship of an artwork to its exterior surroundings, concrete versus terracotta. In the entrance gallery, I designed a curved wooden platform. It's something that you can step up onto and view the white plaque and the small collage in such a way that you have an awareness of your body. I've always been interested in that, that moment when you, know, you see something from far away and it might feel very graphic and simple and you discover at some point along that walk up to the painting that it's not flat, it's actually an object that's been made by joining bodies of color together. You begin to understand that it's not maybe not what you thought. Some of my paintings have kind of wild, squirrely, curvy forms, but that's an intentional um, foil to the hard geometry of blue-black. I just started with blue-black and then I ended up playing around a lot. The truth is paintings really do change according to their surroundings, especially because I work so much with color. Being able to see my, my artwork in a space that's constantly moving was a revelation. I think the best thing that I can offer is that people slow down, they're quiet, and they pay attention not just to my paintings, but to the space that they're standing in, to their surroundings. I don't claim to know a lot about art, but I do remember from years ago, it seems like you've had site-specific uh, things there before. And th that was the first time it went on my radar that there was such a thing. Is that real common? It's definitely a part of what we show at the Pulitzer. Um, many times we do borrow artworks from museums, from artist studios and present them. But because we work in such an architecturally significant and architecturally interesting building, we often do invite artists to create work that responds to those spaces. Another current exhibition that uh, will be up for a bit is Urban Archaeology 
And Stephanie, that's why you were on this program a year ago or <laughs> eight months ago, whenever it was. We've got some images of that. Do you want to recap that for us? Yeah, sure. So we have um, a couple months or a couple weeks left of this exhibition. It closes February fourth. Um, the exhibition was created in partnership with the National Building Arts Center, which is the largest um, collection and of. I didn't mean to interrupt you. What we're looking at now, these are actual pieces of old buildings that could be 100 years old, older than that, that were disregarded. Exactly. Everything in the show is from a former St. Louis building. Um, many of them are well known to people who have lived here uh, for a long period of time. You're looking at famous buildings from downtown in this gallery. We also have a gallery dedicated to Grand Center with uh, buildings that make up the important history in that neighborhood as well. So. There's really um, something for every St. Louis in, in this show who's interested in um, the history and current moment of the city. And maybe mention the Sage location because before you and that other gentleman were on the program before, that wasn't even on my radar and it sounds <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, so I was here last time with Michael Allen. He's the executive director of the National Building Arts Center and they are located in Sage, Illinois. As I was mentioning, they're the largest collection of building artifacts in the nation. So they're an incredible repository, thousands and thousands of um, building parts and archives of the city. They're a huge untapped resource and we were very excited to partner with them. Yeah, how do, you, um, how do these things come about to begin with? When you have different exhibitions like this, I mean, who, whose idea is it then? I mean, it's, it's very much a conversation with our director, with our teams, but it does come from a desire to present um, subjects and uh, works that are timely, that are relevant, that are lively, that are exciting. You know, we really think about the building as well, um, and also artists who really deserve to be seen in St. Louis. We need to take a little break. When we come back, we're gonna preview a couple of exhibitions that will be opening very soon at the Pulitzer. So stay with us, we'll have more City Corner right after this. What I love about St. Louis is the 79 unique neighborhoods nestled into 108 city parks, including Forest Park, which is actually larger than Central Park in New York, and of course, the beautiful Tower Grove Park where I'm at now. Oh, the St. Louis Blues. We've got the St. Louis Surge, two-time WBCBL champions. We've got Harris Stowe, Wash U, St. Louis University, and of course, the 11-time World Series champion, St. Louis Cardinals. So come experience St. Louis. My son, I love you every single day. Last week, Brandon met a girl on a dating app. One day after work, he finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being too pushy? Maybe it was too... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. I would love to go on a date. How does tonight sound? Brandon tried to play it cool, but inside he knew. A girl so smart, so responsible. She must be a keeper. I'm Sandra, this is Jorge, and we were adopted in 2019. I remember when they first came to us, Michael was already a teenager. The whole cliche of they're so lucky to have you guys, and it's no. the other way around. They have changed our family for the better. They chose to love us. They didn't have to. They chose us. Family. 
Learn about adopting a teen from foster care. You can't imagine the reward. Visit AdoptUSKids.org. When I was 10, my mom got deported. We had a difficult time, and I feel that's why I didn't get to finish school. My husband is really supportive in a way that he pushed me to go back to school. She wants to have a career so her kids can look up to her. They both keep me motivated to go to school, and they see that if I do it, like, they can do it too, you know? I feel that everything's possible. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. I'm Steve Potter. Welcome back to City Corner. We're talking about the Pulitzer Arts Foundation, uh, looking back and looking ahead. Well, we've already looked back. We're going to look ahead now. We have uh, two of the curators from the Pulitzer with us this morning, Stephanie Weisberg and Tamara Schenkenberg. And they've both been there a long time. And you probably love going to work every day, I'm thinking. It's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to work there. Too bad I don't do anything that you do. Hey, we want to talk about two new exhibits. Um, I think they both open on March the 8th. That's correct. Right? And the first one is interwoven. Uh, what can you tell me about that? So it's a, it's a solo exhibition presenting the work of the Colombian artist, Delcy Morelos, who you see on screen right what now. What can you tell me about her? So um, Delcy has been working for about three decades. Um, she started as a painter, making sculpture and drawing as well. But over the course of the last uh, 10 years or so, she started to work with soil, which is what you see behind her. Soil. Soil is her primary material. Um, I never heard of a soil artist. Yeah, well. <laughs> It, they do exist, uh, not just Elsie, but there is a tradition. But she's doing something really interesting that comes from a, a, an indigenous perspective. She's part indigenous um, and also thinks really deeply about our relationship to land. So to it's all earth. about connecting people with the environment. It is. And also making us think deeply about our relationship to earth. You know, what does earth provide for us? It sustains us. This is where we grow our food. Um, this is something that we should have deep respect and reverence for, um, but oftentimes we don't think about it. And so her project is really meant to think, you know, to help us think through our relationship to the natural so environment. So is this one of those exhibits you stand there and look at and just think about while you're looking at it for a while? You're moving through it, you're feeling, you're even going to be smelling it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Delcy will be spending two months um, in St. Louis before the exhibition opens to create a work that will be scented with cinnamon and clove. So in addition to kind of moving through the exhibit, looking at the paintings, such as the ones on the screen right now. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, so from afar, they look sort of like bars of a fence. Um, but when you get closer, you see that it's a weaving of sorts. Um, and weaving is actually a metaphor for Delcy. It's something that she makes in her work, and we'll see some image of, images of weaving too. But weaving is also a metaphor. Uh, it helps her think about how opposing elements, you know, the horizontal and the vertical elements of a fabric kind of come together to create a union. So this is one such work. And is that small or large? It's very large, and it is a part weaving, part sculpture, part painting. Um, she constructs this textile from cotton threads that she sort of lattices together into um, this fabric. She puts it on a wall and becomes a canvas of sorts. Hmm. And then over the course of um, many weeks, she applies layer upon layer of, of paint until this very soft, sort of fragile fabric hardens and stiffens and sort of transforms into something earthy and something that's a little bit more resilient and now, firm. You say she's going to be here for two months. Yes, she's creating this major installation with, I think, three tons of soil um, and also fences that will be presented in a maze-like configuration that you could move through. So does she know exactly, I'm thinking maybe she doesn't, does she know exactly what she can, she's going to do when she gets here or does all that kind of develop as she's here? We have preliminary plans because it is a pretty monumental undertaking. Right. Um, so we have a, a sense of the configuration and how she'd like to kind of present it. It's eight foot tall fences and she's going to encrust them with this scented soil in order to invite a reflection on our relationship to earth. And where'd you say she was from? She's from uh, Colombia. Um, she lives in and uh, works in Bogota. 
Huh. Has she ever been to St. Louis before? She's been here twice before. Um, she has met with local people. It's been really important to her to have that local element here to connect with citizens of St. Louis. And the soil that she's using is local soil for that reason intention. You know, I had to laugh when I asked you, I'd never heard of a soil artist. Your answer was sort of that there really is such a thing. Yeah, there is. I mean, if you think about soil as clay, Right, we've been okay. making work with clay for right. for millennia, uh, and then also more in the modern era, it's been more known as land art. Artists who are either creating work um, in landscapes or um, yeah. or making work from land. Yeah, so this is one such weaving again, um, but something that she sort of folds and creates into a sculpture that sits on a wall is a relief. And how often do you do this at the Pulitzer, have an artist come in and spend this amount of time? Is this unusual? It's become, I'd say so. yeah. For two months. For two months is unusual. <laughs> two months is unusual, but it's because it really has to come out of a place. And when you're doing something site specific, you have to be here to do it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. All right, we have uh, another one, and they're going to show the artist here. This is entitled On Earth. Well, this is another one of... Uh, this is another one of Delcy's, just yeah. showing a drawing um, because in addition to sculpture, she creates these very finely drawn, really beautiful um, you know, pieces that uh, will be grouped and presented in the exhibition. So how large is the exhibition? I mean, is it the whole, the whole place? It's not a whole <laughs> building. It's a half a building um, with uh, Delcy's exhibition and then we move into On Earth and the other half. Let's, let's talk about On Earth right now. Yeah, so um, the other exhibition, as um, Tamara just mentioned, On Earth will be in our lower level galleries. Is this yep. the artist? This is one of the artists. There's five artists in the exhibition. This is a video work by the artist Jeffrey Gibson. Um, each of the works in the show are film and video, and they're all meditations on the relationship between um, humans and land. Maybe a familiar theme based on what <laughs> Tamara was just speaking about. Um, you know, the Pulitzer has a long history of exploring ecology in our campus and in our exhibition. So this is both exhibitions are a continuation of that. Um, but we wanted to look in this exhibition at artists who are thinking about uh, how we treat the land that we inhabit and also how we treat the people who um, live on the earth and how we treat each other and how the two might have a relationship to one another. So there, as I mentioned, there are five artists. The earliest work in the show is from 1975, and the most current is from last year. I think we have three or four more images from On Earth. If we do, we could look at those and you could... Yeah, so this is another image from the work by Jeffrey Gibson. He um, is a New York-based artist um, who is notable in this moment because he'll be representing the United States at um, one of the largest exhibitions in the world, the Venice Biennale, later this year. So he will be our representative. Um, and we're <laughs> very excited to be able to include him in the exhibition. This is a work that looks at um, movement uh, that's very rooted in the landscape where uh, Jeffrey Libson works in upstate New York. Let's go to the next one. Um, this is another recent work. It's from 2021, and it's by an artist named Sky Hopinka. Um, he is an indigenous artist. He's a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation, and he produced this work. Um, a lot of it relates to um, a mound site in uh, Wisconsin that is actually related to Cahokia, um, and he's very interested in the history of um, sacred um, burial sites and mounds. How is it related to Cahokia? Um, it's some of the same people who created Cahokia later splintered off, went up north and created this mound site. Wow. Um, and the Ho-Chunk Nation also has um, important roots there. So it's a site of significance to him and it also connects the work to St. Louis and our context here. All right, let's take a look at another. Um, this is uh, a wonderful uh, work, the longest one in the exhibition at 20 minutes, and it is by a Lebanese artist named Ali Cherie. It's looking at the creation of a dam called the Meroe Dam in Sudan and the ways in which the creation of the dam, which is a hydropower plant, um, displaced people and transformed the landscape and the people there. Um, this is... I think uh, an incredibly important contribution to the ways in which conversations about um, ecology and our, um, the environment are very global. 
Okay, I think there's one more at least. And this is a really fun work by a Brazilian artist named Ravani Neunschwander. Um, the work was shot in Brazil the day after Carnival, which is a massive parade that um, happens just before Lent. And in it, um, confetti that's been laid on the floor as part of the Carnival celebrations um, is moved around by these ants. Um, so the protagonist of the video is actually not people, but insects. And we watch as they move through the forest floor um, in mostly collective efforts um, to um, make use of this material that um, humans kind of deposited in the landscape. I'm not sure if we have another one or not. I think that's it. I think that's it. Good. You know better than I. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I'm sorry. got a little confused. We've just got a couple of minutes left, though, mm -hmm. but I want to kind of briefly maybe hit on a couple of things, because in addition to all these exhibitions that we're seeing, and we should say before we go on, both of these open March 8th, right? Correct. And they'll be up for how long? Until early August. So okay. there's plenty of time to come and visit. And now that you mentioned that, uh, what do people need to know? Um, does it cost $50 to get in? And how do people, do they have to make a reservation? <laughs> Yeah, we're lucky in St. Louis in, in that, you know, the Pulitzer, as all of the other museums, are free to the public. Um, we're open the same hours as our neighbor next door, the Contemporary Art Museum, Thursday through Sunday. So there's plenty of opportunities to visit. And always a great website that you can check out, for sure. A um, couple things. Um, these things have already happened, I know, but I just want to give people an example of other things that you do. You did a wellness series on yoga. A couple of them, right? Tis the time in January <laughs> to really think about wellness. You mean because we need to lose weight? Well, no, just because we need to be more mindful and aware <laughs> of our bodies in the world <laughs> to I get understand. grounded for the new well, year. What happened to those? Yeah, th those are ongoing and they, they're happening in January. So our website, again, is a great place to visit for all the details. And we always do wellness series, um, including sound baths and meditations. Okay. And so if this is of interest, I think Pulitzer is a place for you. In 30 seconds, so just quickly, both of you, just uh, what does the Pulitzer mean to you, to St. Louis? And what, what do you want people to know? I think it's just such a vibrant place to gather with friends um, to think about ideas that are timely. And it's just a really place of beauty if you just want a respite from the everyday. Stephanie? Yeah, I think it's a place where um, looking and experiencing art helps spark new ideas, maybe transforms the way you see things after you leave the museum. And um, as Tamar said, it's a great place to connect with other people. Well, we have these two new exhibits that are opening in March. After that, no comment? <laughs> we have a solo exhibition uh, by an American artist um, that's uh, a retrospective that's long overdue, Scott Burton. Um, so that's there, exciting. There's the information, information on the screen about uh, how to get a hold of it. Well, we want to thank you both so much for being here. The Pulitzer is a gem. And uh, thank you, thank Stephanie you. and Tamara, for being here so much. Thank, Thank you so much. See you at the Pulitzer. See you at the Pulitzer. Please come. I'm Steve Potter. Thanks for taking part in this City Corner, and be sure and join us next time. Thank you. Bye.